I am Dr. Rapp, and this is Appreciating Shakespeare. Series 1, Chapter 7, Why All the Footnotes, Shakespeare's Mental Furniture. Session 3, Correspondence and Authority. In the first session of Chapter 7, I discuss the cosmic order, and in the second session, the human order. Today, I want to speak about the relation between them, which we can call the doctrine of correspondence. Then we'll look at the concept of authority, and specifically at Christianity and at Renaissance classicism and humanism. Related to the idea of universal hierarchy in Shakespeare's time was the doctrine of correspondence. According to this concept, every link of the great chain of being was analogous to every other link, every realm to every other realm, each microcosm to the macrocosm. As God is the master of the universe, so the rightful king is master of the state, the man of any family is master of his household, reason is master of the human faculties, the lion is king of the beasts, and so on. The harmony of the spheres is reflected in the harmony of the elements in creation, in the well-run state and household, in the harmonious ordering of humors and of reason and will, emotion and passion, need and desire, in a well-tempered character. Conversely, when the angels rebelled, hell came into being. Eclipses in the heavens portended trouble for men. The resulting war among the elements brought chaos in the form of storms, earthquakes, lightning descending to earth contrary to its nature, just as disorder in the commonwealth brought civil war among men. Lucifer, rebelling against God, behaved like a nobleman rebelling against his king, a child supplanting his father, the desires of the blood overwhelming reason, a horse disobeying its human master, or a sparrow trying to attack an eagle. The last two images come from the play Macbeth. This governing idea of correspondence expressed through the technique of variation, which I discussed in session four of chapter four, made the whole universe into a treasure trove of living metaphors and poetic imagery to be mined by Shakespeare's fertile imagination. To take only one of thousands of examples of Shakespeare's use of the doctrine of correspondence, let's look at Friar Lawrence's speech about natural herbs in Romeo and Juliet, Act Two, Scene Three, Lines 7 through 30. I must upfill this osier cage of ours with baleful weeds and precious juiced flowers. The earth that's nature's mother is her tomb. What is her burying grave, that is her womb. And from her womb, children of divers kind, we sucking on her natural bosom find. Many for many virtues excellent, none but for some, and yet all different. O oh, mickle, that means much, is the powerful grace that lies in plants, herbs, stones, and their true qualities. For naught so vile that on the earth doth live, but to the earth some special good doth give. Nor aught so good, but strained from that fair use, revolts from true birth, stumbling on abuse. Virtue itself turns vice, being misapplied, and vice sometime by action dignified. Within the infant rind of this weak flower, poison hath residence and medicine power. For this, being smelt, with that part cheers each part. Being tasted, stays all senses with the heart. Two such opposed kings encamp them still, meaning always, in man as well as herbs, grace, and rude will. And where the worser is predominant, full soon the canker death eats up that plant. After giving the general structure of things, Friar Lawrence likens the qualities in plants to those in human beings. As the gifts in plants are medicine if well used, and poison if misapplied, so the gifts of any person are good and healing when guided by virtue, and destructive when guided by vice. The speech is in rhymed couplets to give a sense of quiet, orderly meditation to the friar's thoughts. 
The order of balanced pairs of lines in the verse recreates the order of balanced opposites in the natural and human worlds, baleful, precious, weed, flower, and so on, in a series of antitheses of the kind discussed in Session 3 of Chapter 4. In these antitheses, the idea of correspondence is implicit. But let's also consider the specific images. The earth is like mother, tomb, and womb. Plants are like children, infants, people. Their qualities are like forms of grace, residence, and human virtues, and their right use is like human dignity. Their wrong use is like poison, revolt, stumbling, vice, rude will, a worser opposed king, a bad astrological influence, implied by the word predominant, a cankerworm, and death. All of these images, whether stated or implied, speak to the correspondence of realms. The realm of nature, implied in the images of weed, flower, plant, herbs, stones. The realm of the human body and soul, in images like stumbling, senses, heart, virtue, vice, life, death. The realm of society and the state, in images like true birth, revolt, opposed kings, worser king. The realm of the heavens, in the image of predominance, which implies the influence of a star or constellation. And the realm of the divine order, implied in the word grace. The use of this kind of correspondence among all realms is a staple of Shakespeare's metaphorical language, and being aware of it helps us to perceive the full weight of his images. Now let's look at the concept of authority. First, we need to be clear about the meaning of the word authority. Being heirs of the Enlightenment, we believe in human reason and individual liberty. Being heirs of Romanticism, we believe in individualism and progress. As a result, we tend to think of authority as oppressive by definition. We think of the past as inferior to the present and even more inferior to the future. Unless we stop to think about it, liberty to many of us means the freedom to do whatever we want, short of hurting others, unhindered by tradition, religion, God, government, teachers, parents, and the past. As a result of this pre-existing tendency, we delight, for example, in such bumper stickers as Question Authority. We don't seem to notice the authority that the bumper sticker itself is claiming. Should we question its authority? By what authority should we question authority? Suddenly we are faced with the problem of which authority we should question. If we are honest, these questions will lead us to examine our fundamental principles. Is questioning authority the most basic of our beliefs? Are some authorities more authoritative than others? By which principles of judgment are we to judge an authority? What Shakespeare meant by the word authority was significantly different. Whereas we tend to judge authorities in the light of our own desires and goals, Shakespeare and his audience, along with most traditional cultures East and West, tended to judge their desires and goals in the light of past authorities. Though Shakespeare knew that being human, traditional authorities must themselves have been flawed, he nevertheless also believed that they were truly authoritative. He believed, more or less, that Aristotle and St. Paul and Dionysius the Areopagite and Plutarch and Holinshed knew what they were talking about. This is a huge difference from us, and it is crucial in understanding not only references to Aristotle or dramatizations of Plutarch and Holinshed, but also the motivations of characters and the meanings of plays. His belief in the authority of past masters does not mean that Shakespeare did not have a problem with authority but his problem was different from ours. Our problem is to decide whether something said or done in the past has value for us and to know on what grounds we judge it. By contrast, Shakespeare's problem was how to make the self-evident authority of the best authorities of the past into vivid, 
moving, and significant experience in the present. To a great extent, Shakespeare inherited the authority of the medieval synthesis discussed earlier, whose unification of the Christian and classical visions of man and his place in creation not only formed the background of Shakespeare's worldview, but provided the poet with a wealth of images and stories. So now let's look at those two traditions of authority themselves. We'll take Christianity first. Because of the religious conflicts in England and in Shakespeare's time, it was dangerous for any writer to take an open and clear stand on any matter that might become a subject of religious controversy. Shakespeare was a child less than 50 years after Martin Luther's 95 Theses inaugurated the Protestant Reformation. There was no separation of church and state in Shakespeare's England. Both Protestants under Catholic monarchs and Catholics under Protestant monarchs were in danger of persecution. All books and plays were subject to censorship. As a result, Shakespeare had to make a point of avoiding explicitly sectarian arguments in his plays. He could poke fun at Malvolio for his stuffed shirt ways, but he had to stop short of directly accusing him of Puritanism. He could show the ghost of Hamlet's father in the setting of a foreign country come from purgatorial fires, but he couldn't be too explicit about where he stood on the Catholic doctrine of purgatory. As for Shakespeare's own personal beliefs about the various religious controversies of his time, we do not know precisely what they were. However, the obstacles that prevented many from expressing opinions and beliefs in that time, so far from hampering Shakespeare, in fact seem to have had the opposite effect on him. They drove him to articulate in his plays a version of Christianity that any Christian believer could embrace. We will probably never know exactly what Shakespeare believed in his heart about the differences in particular doctrines that divided one Christian sect from another. But no poet apart from Dante has ever portrayed the universal, humane spirit at the center of the Christian religion so clearly or so movingly. This is not the place to outline the entire Christian view of the universe, but several basics that reappear over and over in Shakespeare are worth keeping in mind. God created the universe and man. God gave man free will, the capacity to make free moral choices, however constraining the circumstances of nature, society, fortune, and individual psychology. Man, seduced by the serpent, a rebel angel in disguise, fell from grace through his own pride and falls again daily to the temptations in the world and within his own heart. At man's fall, the human soul was weakened, the body was subjected to corruption and eventual death, and the world was cut off from the company of heaven and the music of the spheres. Mankind became subject to mutability, corruption, and mortality. Every human being, whatever his or her circumstances, has the opportunity to be redeemed from corruption, sin, and death through faith in the saving grace of God made available to man through the incarnation and crucifixion of Christ. For Catholics, that faith was exercised under the authority of the Church and its sacraments. For Protestants, under the sole authority of Holy Scripture. In the meantime, in this life, every human person is being tested and will be judged by God, either at the moment of death or at the last judgment, for his or her free will choices. As we saw in the podcast of chapter 5, Shakespeare's characters reflect that people may be good, with their virtue rewarded in the next life if not in this, or bad, with their evil punished eventually in this life and in the next, or mixed, in which case change of heart and penitence are called for to clear the way for redemption. All these principles for Shakespeare are not merely articles of a faith that may be taken seriously here but ignored there. They are built into the structure of reality and hold true in little ways and in great. 
Shakespeare set King Lear in a pre-Christian world to demonstrate precisely that. Compare how Kate in The Taming of the Shrew rebels against rightful authority and how Macbeth does. According to Shakespeare's inherited view of the nature of things, Kate cannot live happily ever after with Petruchio unless she is converted from pride and rebelliousness to humility and obedience, whereupon she discovers that reality, in the person of her husband, means everything for her good. Macbeth, who refuses to repent for his utterly self-serving rebellion, is hunted down by a coalition of all reality, including his own nature, and finally expunged from the world he has polluted with his evil will. These plays are not, for Shakespeare, merely illustrations of abstract principles. They are not merely moral lessons. They are representations of the way things really are. And this remains true for all his plays from the first to the last. Hamlet may struggle to work out just what is going to happen to him in death, but there is no doubt in his mind that God exists and judges all souls. These are unquestioned givens in Hamlet's meditations. Of the four protagonists, who are also sinners, in Shakespeare's four greatest tragedies, Hamlet, Othello, King Lear, and Macbeth, we are explicitly meant to believe that two are saved and at least one is damned. Hamlet's readiness in Act 5, Scene 2, Line 222, followed by Horatio's Flights of Angels Sing Thee to Thy Rest at Line 360, and Lear's Forget and Forgive in Act 4, Scene 7, Line 83, and It is a Chance that Does Redeem All Sorrows That Ever I Have Felt at Act 5, Scene 3, Line 267 to 268, followed by Look There, Look There at Line 312, enforce our sense that the spiritual progress of these men has been from benightedness to insight, from self-will to redemption. Macbeth is clearly damned as he explicitly chooses to be, and Othello, choosing to throw away his soul in a final act of pride, will certainly be damned unless he is granted by our imaginations an exceptional divine mercy not expressible within the confines of the play. Now let's turn to Renaissance classicism and humanism. By Shakespeare's time, the Renaissance rediscovery of much of the art of antiquity had inspired new attention to the power of human reason in understanding the nature of man and society. Church doctrine, though for the most part not repudiated by the early humanists, underwent re-examination in the light of human reason and classical literature. Much canon law, that is, the law of the church, was replaced by civil law, the law of the city or state. The arts of drama, poetry, music, painting, and architecture flourished. The value of educational preparation for the priesthood gave way to classical learning directed to secular careers. Figures associated with this resurgence of human-centered classical learning include the poets Petrarch and Boccaccio, and the Neoplatonist, Ficino and Pico della Mirandola. It can be argued that the Protestant Reformation, the Catholic Counter-Reformation, the Enlightenment, and secular science all grew out of this movement. Upon Shakespeare, the influence of Renaissance humanism came largely through the influence of the great Christian humanist scholar Erasmus of Rotterdam and of his friend Sir Thomas More who succeeded Cardinal Wolsey as Lord High Chancellor of England under Henry VIII. Thomas More, by the way, was one of the first to educate his daughters, as well as his son, in the classical languages and literature. The commitment of Erasmus and More to the training of capable youth in the language and literature of the ancients fostered the foundation of many grammar schools of the kind that Shakespeare probably attended. As a result of this resurgence of classical learning, in addition to the basic teachings of Christianity, Shakespeare inherited a huge body of knowledge and belief from the classical world, that is, from ancient Greece and Rome, and the philosophical and literary traditions 
to which they gave birth. Just as the Romans traced their origins through Aeneas back to Troy, so Britain traced its origins through Brutus, a different one from the conspirator against Julius Caesar, back to Rome. Greek and Roman history provided not only stories which Shakespeare might dramatize, but examples of the lives of important and great men and women whose experience might shed light on the circumstances and attitudes of his own time and ours. For example, it would be hard to find a Shakespeare play that lacks a reference to something in Ovid's Metamorphoses, and Shakespeare based whole plays on Plutarch's lives. As we discussed in the podcast on Chapter 2 about Shakespeare's life, Shakespeare's education consisted in learning, by our standards, a huge amount of Latin literature and history. The classical world was the source of the long and elaborate literary tradition which Shakespeare inherited, including stories from Greek and Roman epics, drama, romance, and history, genres, epic, lyric, oratorical, meditative, and dramatic, rhetorical theory, and philosophy. Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, Marcus Aurelius, and Boethius, to name only a few. Shakespeare and his audience were perhaps even more familiar with the names of Hercules, Hector, and Achilles, Caesar, Brutus, Mark Antony, and Cleopatra, than with the Richards, Edwards, and Henrys of English history. So much for the unified worldview that Shakespeare inherited. In the next session, we will look at the disintegrating forces at work during Shakespeare's time. I am Dr. Rapp, and this is Appreciating Shakespeare.